Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination, cultivating true contentment, the art of living a life of quality over quantity. Visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, at our simplified URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From a Monday motivational post, recipes, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and reader's favorite regular weekly post, This and That, which is posted each Friday morning. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 331st episode of the Simple Sophisticate. Norman and I have been enjoying a very rainy but warm weekend here at home, here at Le Papillon and Bend. And it has been quite a punctuating end to a week that found me finding this rhythm that I keep talking about on the blog in the past month or so that I've never had the opportunity to settle into for a permanent duration and finding myself truly feeling rejuvenated at the same time grateful for all the ideas that just keep popping up. It's almost as if it's very similar to this time of year in the garden when you have warm air And the rain comes, and as soon as that rain comes, all of the seeds just start popping out of the earth, whether it's what you want or what you don't want, all this awesome growth. And it's just a matter of being able to harvest it or find it or appreciate it or take continue to take care of it and bring it into its full fruition. And I'm sharing this because today's topic is about noticing specifically how to notice the awesomeness in your life and the world. And so as I've been going through my journey of life these last 43 years, and now just these past handful of weeks, really, I've been trying to get back to a slower schedule over the past year since my retirement from teaching now that I only have one career pursuit and focus. But it hasn't been until this past month, having returned from a travel trip abroad that I've been planning for a while, the book launch, that really I'm able to experience it. Slow down and really see so much more. Going faster doesn't mean we gain a deeper way of life or more quality. It just means we're going faster. And so today, inspired by a book I recently picked up, but that was published actually a couple years ago, pre-pandemic, I'm going to share with you different ways, very specific ways on how to notice the awesomeness in your everyday. And I think what you'll discover and what I'm discovering now and continue to discover more vividly than ever is that when we know how to notice and we recognize the power of noticing, we see almost a technicolor appearance to our days and our, our life. And it's, it just will make you stop. At least it's, it makes me stop in awe and just, (laughs) 
just spontaneously smile and go, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. I know I'm bringing back a 90s term, but man, that vo- that term has been in my vocabulary <laughs> since I was growing up and it continues to be so. And um, it really captures that feeling. So before I get into our episode today and the topic, this week's Petit Plaisir is a film, an international film, I think you'll quite enjoy. And it was it was recommended to me by a longtime listener and reader of the podcast and the blog. And I'm so thankful they they they, they shared with me um, this title because indeed, indeed, I really did enjoy it and I think you will too. So I'll share that film with you at the end of our conversation today, but let's chat about how to notice the awesomeness in your life and the world. I want to begin with a quote from William James. Quote, our life experience will equal what we have paid attention to, whether by choice or default. To hold our attention on a singular point of focus exhibits a strength of being able to thwart the tugs of distraction. And to be able to thwart distraction takes conscious intention to notice, to choose to hold ourselves in the present and to be an observer. An observer, contrary to what many may at first liken it to being, is not a wallflower or someone who is shy or passive in how they engage with life. No, 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 no. An observer demonstrates awareness of the world beyond their inner world, beyond their own thoughts, beyond their own worries and their past experiences and biases. An observer acknowledges that the moment in which they find themselves is far more awesome when we step away from the past and choose not to look past today into the future and instead hold ourselves and our attention in the present moment without expectation of what we must see or find. There are many reasons for noticing of any sort. It might be when we're looking for the good, so we're keeping an open eye out for just the awesomeness and the good stuff. Or on the contrary, it might be looking for the threat Or it might be very neutral, just simply observing, as we mentioned above. In order for noticing to become a honed yet unconscious skill in our lives, today I'm going to be addressing the latter. So just the neutral, simply observing. And I'll I'll touch on the other two as well. But by simply just being a great observer, just taking everything in, whatever it is, you bring more awesomeness into your life. Depending upon our childhood or our relationship with any caretaker during our youth or in a culture where and if we were perceived as inferior or the minority, if the day's events unfolded based on how we engaged, what we said or didn't say, did or didn't do, we may have become very skilled at noticing others' moods, behaviors, and tone of voice because that noticing skill was a survival skill for a better, less contentious environment. And I put better in air quotes because it's only better for the person who has the power, who's in the superior position. However, it wasn't a noticing of what all that surrounded us, but rather a noticing in order to avoid threats, to avoid pain or belittling most specifically and solely. If we were so fortunate to be raised and then as an adult live in an environment where joy was a regular and consistent feeling, good moments and peace-filled and happy feelings, even if different from those around us, were celebrated without judgment, then noticing the good is a muscle we have been toning and maybe didn't realize what a gift we were given. I recently read The Art of Noticing by Rob Walker, and his introduction shares that the environment in which many of us find ourselves, if we aren't exercising our noticing muscles, can detract our attention and thus prevent us from living well or fulfilled. Walker includes a quote from philosopher George Simmel, who in 1903 wrote, quote, the stimulation of modern life wears down the senses, leaving us dull, indifferent, and unable to focus on what really matters, end quote. That was in 1903, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, which while I know many of you may say, well, it has only gotten worse, I would counter an understandable remark by saying it's a perennial issue, an issue of whether or not to choose to notice the awesomeness, to 
notice when we need to turn off the noise if we perceive it to be noise and live more presently rather than just let what comes and what happens happen. There is a reason stimulation of constant bombardment of noises, whether they're pings, quickly displayed images in movies, programming, advertisements, and overlaying of music with films, shows, etc. There's a reason why they occur, to give you no space to think, and instead to tell you how to think. The only way such stimulation can work is if its creator knows where its audience is at the present moment. The advertiser, the media, the speaker has to meet the audience where it is. Then they pull the audience whose attention they now have where they want them to go or to think. If where they begin their messaging is too far removed from where we, the audience, are, their message or idea will not land and thus not be effective. So to this point, whether it's 1903 or 2023, the world around us will forever be trying to overstimulate us in order to wear us down to refrain from thinking and nudge us to just go along, letting us believe it was our idea in the first place. Our job is to be thinkers critical thinkers and choose to strengthen the skill of noticing or as what is often described here on this podcast and the Simply Luxurious Life blog as well, to be fully present and thus mindful. So how exactly do we become better at noticing all that is around us and thus witness, observe, and savor the awesomeness in our life and the world? How do we see all that is around us clearly without the veneer of societal biases and norms? I'd like to share with you a list today of ideas for doing just that, for seeing clearly, seeing the awesomeness, and thus discovering how quite sweet everyday life is exactly where you live, call home, and make your life. Let's get into the list. Number one, how do we do this? By slowing down. I can already see some listeners' response to this first item on our list today. The reasons for their inability, they say, to slowing down are on the tip of your tongue. I don't disagree that the life you are currently living will not slow its pace to match yours when you choose to shift to a speed that enables you to notice the world and yourself as you live in it. However, my first question to you is, Whose needs are not being fulfilled when you slow down? Likely, it is others' needs, not yours. Because if you are acknowledging you would like to slow down but cannot, you are already expressing a need to take your foot off the pedal. We cannot change anyone else's behavior but our own if we wish to engage in healthy relationships. So we cannot know why others feel they must go at the pace that they travel. But if the pace you are traveling leaves you unable to feel fulfilled, leaves you regularly trying to catch your breath, hitting the snooze button, drinking one more cup of caffeine, etc., then slowing down is the first and best way to be able to notice anything that will be beneficial and incorporate it regularly into your life to see significant change. When our regular everyday pace slows down, as I was talking about the top of our episode today, it's much like a train that has halted at the train station. We can situate ourselves, read the signs clearly, take in the scenery without it whizzing by, and really observe the detail in our lives. What's working? What's not? Why is it working? Why is it not? When we observe, because we have slowed our pace, we are able to take note of what is working, what provides comfort, genuine support, real love, and what does not. Then with this clear information at hand, we begin to make better decisions. Not being rushed, we choose with confidence what and whom to engage with or to refrain from and know in our minds why we are doing so and that it is our true self that is making the decision, not an outside influence. So that's the reason for truly sincerely considering slowing down if the pace you're going at is too much, too much, too fast, and you're not able to fully savor your life that you live. 
Number two, celebrate this truth about being human. Quote, more than any other creature, humans can outmaneuver our base instincts, end quote. Base instincts in humans deal with surviving, not thriving, but surviving. So in other words, we are programmed to instinctively look for the threat, not for what will make us smile, not for what will make us feel at ease or happy or love. No, no, no. Instincts, however, are not intuition. So let's not conflate these two. Instincts are pre-programmed based on experiences we have never had, but as human beings living in a civil modern world, our instincts are leading us astray and causing us more harm and doling a life that could be so much more fulfilling and peace-filled. Intuition, on the other hand, is honed. It is a skill that takes time to understand because each of our intuitions, while residing within us, is waiting for our true selves to emerge and for us to consciously understand who that is. Once we come to understand our own language, translating what our intuition is telling us becomes second nature. So back to this idea of outmaneuvering our base instincts and the idea, this quote, which came from Rob Walker. For survival purposes as a child or as an adult who has had to be constantly looking out for threats due to variables beyond their control, noticing takes on a negative but necessary connotation. Even when the threat is no longer, we have removed ourselves from that environment, that person, etc., our instinct is to stay vigilant and only keep an eye out for threats. This is where we must outmaneuver what we have done in the past and instead begin to observe all that surrounds us now as we move forward. Walker astutely points out that it is no coincidence that a civil and modern society that feels overwhelmed by stimulation is simultaneously seeing a rise in meditation and mindfulness practices, teachings, and routines. This is a beautiful and constructive example of outmaneuvering. Humans can bring about necessary change for a more enriching life when we acknowledge that how we are currently living is not fulfilling. So that's number two, understanding that we really do have this capability of changing our base instincts when we recognize that they're actually harming us or not benefiting to a quality of life to our quality of life. Number three is to embrace solitude. Discover the gift and nourishment sharing time in your own company can be. A Simply Luxurious Life reader recently and bravely shared that it wasn't until they felt truly lonely that they found their true selves. Why? Because by looking the feeling of lonely in the face, they came to understand what made them feel lonely. And as this reader journeyed through the feeling, she didn't avoid it or turn away from it once she met it. She found ways of living her days that included time in her own company, partaking fully, having intentionally chosen for no one else to be there but herself and finding deep enjoyment. Why? Because it wasn't her being alone that made her feel lonely. Rather, it was a disconnection to a culture or the world that was around her in that moment that made her feel lonely. So she went and changed the culture that she engaged with, meaning how and who she spent her time with, how she engaged in her daily routine. What she discovered by doing this, by looking lonely in the face and not running away from it, was her true self. And this self-knowledge was aided by letting herself run into the feeling lonely, which then led her to understanding what her true needs were to feel fulfilled and nourished. Loneliness often is misdefined and misunderstood. Loneliness is not being without other people. Loneliness is not knowing what fulfills you and thus not feeling connected to the world in which you find yourself. It is when you embrace solitude, a necessity, not a luxury, that you give yourself the ability to be the student of yourself. You are forced to be honest with yourself if you choose to be courageous enough to stand in the space where you are the only human being. It is my regular moments of solitude where I am refueled, nourished, and find clarity. It is in my regular moments of solitude 
where I reflect on my feelings, events, and thus come to fully understand myself so that moving forward, I know clearly how to engage well with others, to apply what I now know, and connect more sincerely and deeply when I step out of my solitude. So that's number three. How to become a better noticer, to notice things in the present, is to embrace solitude. Understand yourself, and thus you begin to be more brave in every moment, no matter what it is, to really see it as clearly as possible. Number four, let your curiosity be your guide. Being curious leads you to new discoveries. And each step forward prompted by curiosity strengthens your ability to be vulnerable. Your first steps fueled by curiosity may be small and appear insignificant, but they all add up to you becoming a person who knows how to be present and keep an open mind, open to what will cross your path, and instead of judging it, simply exploring it. Whatever it is that stirs your curiosity, such discoveries are much like the cookie crumbs leading you to and on a trail of fulfillment. You begin to discover what brings you to life, what enlivens you in a way other activities may not have. And while other activities may prompt curiosity in others, you begin to celebrate the differences and realize that following anyone else's path is not the route to true contentment for you. All of this is to say each of us finds our way to true contentment on different paths. And this is something to celebrate because when we find our path, we're not looking at other people's route, but grateful they have found the grounding peace just as we have. So that's number four on how to be able to notice the awesomeness in your life and in your world. Let your curiosity be your guide. Now those were, some of them were very concrete, such as embrace solitude, and slowing down to, although that's very general, each of us will do it in a, in a unique way to us. Conceptual ideas, though, all four of those embodied conceptual ideas, broad, abstract concepts, and you have to apply them in a specific way to your life. Now what I'd like to do is share with you a, more than a handful of ideas for noticing. How do you notice things? How do you become a better noticer, as we're, we're going to call it, someone who's more aware of everything that's around them? So let's take a look at this list. Choosing to be an observer means we are holding ourselves fully in the present moment. And rather than judging what we see, which involves our unconscious biases, we are simply noting. We see it. This is what we see, hear, feel. The senses become our translators. So let's take a look at these concrete ideas for noticing. Number five, I'm just going to keep the list going here. Five is choose to engage in only one task at a time. So mono tasking here. By choosing to engage in only one activity, we are not distracted by another tug of the other tasks. Our attention is given wholly, our focus is on one thing, and we can take it all in and are less likely to rush and thus deepen the quality of our efforts. Sounds simple and insignificant, but again, it's about your attention and where you're placing it. Are you placing it wholly on something or is there part of that or is there part of that attention that's being pulled away or being, you know, th thoughts are, are pulled away thinking about this these other tasks. So that's number 5. Number 6 is to reflect regularly. Make a list weekly, yearly, etc. of just what is. Let me explain. To note what has evolved, changed, is no longer, has begun, make a list first of what was just last week at this exact time. If you would like to go further, make a list of what was happening in your life one year ago today, perhaps even two years ago or three years ago. When you create such lists, you are not passing judgment, just stating the facts, truths of what happened, was in place, how you felt, and why you felt it. I enjoy this regular practice for weekly reflection and what I have found, especially when I make the yearly and the bi-yearly lists, is that the headaches and bothers at the time are no longer remembered. And thankfully, often the large headaches have been overcome and that gives me calm and confidence. Moreover, I am reminded that any harried or fretful thinking I had did not materialize and that savoring all that was going well was the best thing to do so that better engagement occurred. 
Whether I wisely heeded that advice then or not is another thing, but upon reflection, I am encouraged to do so moving forward. And so thus I gain more self-knowledge and I engage better in the next opportunity I have. I like making these lists. As I said, I do the weekly one just about every week. I recently did the yearly one and it did. It grounded me. It reminded me of what you remember. Not everything was wonderful. Things are going to happen that are out of your control, losing a loved one, things like that. But what I'm trying to get at is where you have choices to grow, to calm, to steady, to progress. Things do take time and often these reflections remind us of that truth and give us confidence if there's anything right now that is just beginning or you have set in motion. It reminds us of the power of patience, perseverance, and clarity. So that's number six. Number seven, allow silence in conversation to be present. While in a conversation with another person, often when there is a span of silence, one or both people will try to fill it. Why not let the space of silence be? In so doing, you let thoughts marinate, you give time for a response rather than a reaction, and how you hold yourself in this span of silence has the potential to provide comfort to the other that indeed such a silence is okay and you are not rushing and you are choosing to be right where you are and with them. Sometimes I think we tend to fill the gaps because either we want to end the conversation and get it over with, or we want to hold that person there because we're enjoying their company, but we don't know how or if they'll stay. And again, we're talking about those conversations where we feel we have to fill the gap. And you may already be with people in your life where you don't feel you have to fill the gap. That is so awesome. And that's, that is where you will become a better noticer because what you're noticing is there's a gap here. I'm fine with it. They're fine with it. It doesn't say anything except for that there's silence. It's not saying, and it's not a passive converse. It's not a passive train of thought that's happening here. This is just space to catch our breath, to think, to be, and that's okay. Once you begin to notice such moments, notice how you feel in them. At first you may feel uncomfortable unsettled as you acknowledge you want to fill the space but is there really anything that needs to be said at that moment if you don't know how to respond to what has just been shared give time and see how you feel not rushing to speak this has been a lovely aha for me and and it's something I would do as a teacher and I was taught to do as a teacher is to give the students time to ponder the question you've just asked don't just rush to the first hand that pops up because it might be the same hand every single time, because everyone processes things at different paces and different information lands differently with every single student. So it was this space of time to give the students time to think, time to notice that it's okay to think, that this is a safe spot, that I don't have to be rushed. And if you are with somebody you enjoy being with or you're getting to know someone, This is a comforting feeling. At least it is for me. Maybe it is for you too. All right, that's number seven. Number eight, just listen. My mother does this very well. She will just listen to me. And I've seen her do this with my niece too when they're in conversation. She doesn't insert her opinion, pass judgment, or interrupt And thus, I meander in my words until sometimes I discover something I had not realized simply by sharing and working through my ideas verbally. (laughs) Of course, just sitting silently all the time doesn't consist of a conversation, but the practice is to know when to just listen. This is a skill in noticing. When you do this, you open up space to just notice, take what is in, be an observer, You take in not only the words, but the person you're speaking with, you take in their physical movements, facial expressions, and all that is going on around them. You also, again, give yourself time to observe, and thus when you choose to engage verbally in the conversation, you are responding 
having given thought to what you will say and how it will be received, because you have wholly taken in all that the speaker has presented. So again, just listen. This will deepen your skills in noticing, because again, it forces you to step out of your head, out of your inner thoughts, and observe what's going around you, which you have no control over if you're just listening, just observing, and you can then respond rather than react. Number nine, regular digital silence. Walker suggests taking a week of digital silence to not engage or connect on your social platforms, but instead just observe. You can check your email, your social media accounts, but if you are trying to become more aware of the world around you and really see what does surround you, don't comment, like, or do anything else that is engaging or engagement on your part. Instead, just observe and see what you notice. What really does draw your eye and why? Discover if you really do need to respond and why you previously felt you needed to. Walker goes further to entertain the idea that if we had a limit to how many times we could comment or respond each week, where would we place our energy and focus? Why would we do this? All of this silence we choose to welcome into our lives, as I just shared in this one, number nine, but the previous eight and number seven, give you the opportunity to become more aware and thus discover if you are engaging in the world in a way that is in alignment with the life you want to live and how you want to show up in the world. So three ideas there that all revolve around silence in some way to strengthen your ability of noticing. Number 10. Audit your daily sonic profile. This particular suggestion by Walker caught my attention, especially as someone who lives alone. And for any Simply Luxurious Life reader who tunes into the monthly A Cup of Moments, Norman's snoring, something that I adore, is more pronounced than I realized when it is captured on video as it has been in the last couple of videos. (laughs) He sleeps closer to the microphone um, when I'm taping these videos. Anyway, This always makes me smile when I hear him snore, whether it's on the recording or just us hanging out in the house. Because when we take note of all the sounds in our everydays, we might discover certain ones provide comfort while others dull our experience and still others numb us to truly feeling what we need to feel. I've spoken about this before, the idea of noticing sounds in our lives and how they affect us. But I have realized that as I have grown, I am more and more comfortable with silence and prefer it as unnecessary sounds, if not soothing to my ear. For example, I adore birdsong and find it nurtures and encourages my writing. But contrarily, the sound of a leaf blower drives me up a wall, leaving me unable to concentrate. What I have also realized is that part of why I needed some noises in my life in the background, for example, and not having complete silence in my house or wherever I am, for example, the television on or the radio on in the background, was because I was unable to be mindful, unable to master my mind, and was not able to control where my mind would wander. And that, I would just say it scared me or it bothered me or it was really uncomfortable. As well, advertisements are always muted now in my house or turned off when they appear during shows I'm watching. As after having taught rhetoric for many years in school, I am now aware of the subtle influences of skillful advertising companies and don't want to introduce any ideas I don't choose to watch or explore mindfully and entirely into my days when all I want to do is relax with a quality program. The auditing of your sonic profile, so the sound profile, the sounds in your life, also includes the small everyday sounds such as the dishwasher's humming, the dryer's whirling, ice crackling when you pour the liquid over the top for sipping. Observe the natural sounds that surround you as well, the drizzling of rain, the gentle breeze, and dancing of the leaves. When you begin to notice all of the auditory details of your days and how they affect you, you begin to pay more attention to how to build a life, a day that nourishes you, your mind, and your being. So that's number 10. Audit your daily sonic profile. Number 11. Be alone in public. I sincerely enjoy doing this, and because of how I live my life, I am alone in public often, 
and not meaning alone, but I'm not going out in public with someone else specifically. And I am quite comfortable with it. Being alone in public also makes me more deeply appreciative when I am spending time with others out in public as I engage differently, as my attention is primarily on the conversation I'm having with that person that I went to the, the, the dinner with or to the event with, rather than the exterior goings on around us. When I am alone in public, I notice details far more quickly, easily, and deeply. I also notice how others are not noticing all that is going on around them, which, as I shared above, is what most of us, including myself, do when we're with someone we want to be with. We give them our full attention and engagement. And this is a good thing. The balancing of both time in public alone and with others enables us to become more aware of our environment and how the community we live in engages, organizes, what it enjoys, explores, and celebrates, etc. I also find myself being open to new and unexpected conversations and opportunities when I am alone in public because you see more. And if you are observing and not judging, you are open to whatever may cross your path. This doesn't mean you have to engage, but you see it. And that is what noticing is all about. So that's number 11. Be alone in public. The last concrete idea of strengthening our noticing skill that I'd like to share with you is journaling your days. And this one does not come from the book. It comes from me. It's what I have found to be a very strong tool to deepening my ability to notice. And one that I have found when I don't know what to do with my mind due to feeling restless or confused or at the beginning of shifting my days to a slower pace. So just in this past five or so weeks, as I mentioned, you know, there's been a shift, there's been a change and it's been a conscious change that I've wanted to make to my every days. And so whenever, you know, I'm, I'm still just maybe a bit, a bit unsettled about it or it feels odd because I have not done this ever. Um, I journal. And it really does help because when I sit down to journal, I begin to notice what just thinking about what I noticed could not accomplish. Putting on paper how I felt when I woke up and how the morning sun streamed through the reading nook window brought a smile to my face reminds me of the awesomeness that I may have forgotten about by the end of the day. Oh, that's right. The day started pretty awesome. Oh my gosh, these other things happened and and they, they made... the, 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 the day's routine be put at ease. Very enjoyable. Such seemingly trivial noticings are actually, as Walker states in his introduction, vital. Quote, paying attention connects us with others. It makes you eager to find interest in the everydays, to notice what everybody else overlooks. These are vital skills and noble goals. End quote. When you begin to really pay attention to the present moment and observe with an open mind, you begin to realize what matters to you, as Walker states, and you begin to let go of what was told to you that you should care about, what your life should look like, and what next steps you should take, because you now know what brings you to life when certain details, events, people, activities, time alone awakens your true self. When you have that knowledge about yourself, because you do, you gain that from becoming a really skillful noticer, you start to make better decisions for your, for your life today and moving forward, infuse your every days with more noticing, more observations. And by doing so, you will strengthen your ability to hold yourself in the present moment, which strengthens your ability to be mindful, which all contributes to your discovering how awesome your everydays are and the whole world you choose to live in fully. I hope you enjoy today's topic. It involves a lot of different concepts we've talked about over the years, but I think the simple act of just noticing to, 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 to be aware of how powerful that skill is and the information you're going to gain from that it's just going to, it's going to be the book of you. You're going to be able to see and know for certain, certain things that are going to make choices that you're going to be presented with so much easier to make. All right. You can find the show notes in this entire list of 12 ways for more conceptual ways and 
eight more concrete ways of strengthening your ability to notice the awesomeness in your everyday at the simplyluxuriouslife.com slash podcast 331. And I've also included a couple of posts and episodes from the archives. One is about how to let go of distraction and why that is a definite must do. And also what we gain by letting go of distractions which would prevent us from being able to notice the everyday. Those two posts and episodes are on the show notes as well. And I'll be back with this week's Petit Plaisir. This week's Petit Plaisir is a film that, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, uh, a listener of this show and a reader of the blog shared with me and was confident I wasn't in, would enjoy. And she was absolutely correct. So I want to give a big thank you to that listener and reader. It's called Toscana, and it is a film you will find on Netflix. It was just released back in May, so just a few weeks ago. And it's an international film because it begins in Denmark. You have a reputable, highly, um, highly decorated chef, Danish chef, whose father lives in Tuscany. He is estranged from his father. So his mother lives up in Denmark. That's who raised him. And this gentleman, who I would say is probably in his late 40s, early 50s, um, receives a notification after the passing of his father that the Tuscan estate, building, grounds, property is left to him. And he actually doesn't want it. He doesn't want to have anything to do with his father. And you have him just about ready to open a brand new restaurant that's going to try to be the legacy of his career as a chef. And the the, the first few scenes of him and his kitchen with his sous chefs, the meals they, the, the dishes they prepare will just make your mouth water. Just they're beautiful and they look delicious, but just an art form. So he tries to sell his inheritance as quickly as possible so he has the funds to open up this new restaurant. And that's just the beginning of this film. And I won't share too much more, but I wanted to let you know that it's, it is international in the sense that you have them speaking Danish and then you have him going to Italy and you have some Italian being spoken, but their shared language is English. So most of the film is actually in English. But so don't be afraid of it if you don't if you don't prefer subtitles. I actually do. I tend to learn a lot more. But then I usually do that with French, and this is no French in it, just Italian and and Danish, and and then we have English. And what I really appreciate about this film, it is not your typical romantic film. I'm just going to give that away right now. Thank you so much to the filmmakers for this. It's not the fairy tale. You know how I feel about the fairy tale ending. And I think that, ho- I hopefully think that is changing now more, but I think we see it more changing in international films or never really existent in international films. But it was just a more realistic and civil and loving and kind ending, which is what I think makes it romantic. It's a very human, um, compassionate ending and inspiring as well. So I will not say too much more until we get to this trailer so you can hear what it's all about. While the trailer has been dubbed in English, and it's actually not a bad dubbing, I will say that, I highly recommend watching it in its traditional form with a little bit of the Danish spoken, a little bit of the Italian, and the English. So here is the trailer for Toscana. Theodal, your father, has passed three weeks ago. Your father leaves behind a rather large estate. It says you're inheriting Ristonki. Yeah, I really don't care that I am. And that'll satisfy you? You don't get it. Even exceptional people need to be happy, too. Yeah, I feel good. You f- I f- You are so angry. This is Italy, my friend. You're selling a property. This is not a bicycle. Look around. Enjoy. You're too done. Sophia. Sophia? She basically <laughs> grew up in the Castello. What are you doing here? Processing. This is not for analyzing. This is for feeling. Soul is the only thing you cannot buy. No one is special, but everyone can become special (laughs) if the right (laughs) eyes are looking your way. This is what I do. (laughs) What are you, a botanist? 
So as you may have heard there, it is, it's a journey for this, this top chef. He's trying to find an inner peace that he does not have. He's trying to find some closure with his father and their relationship. And it's just a lot of storylines that can connect for a lot of people that tune in, I think, no matter whether you are a chef or not. I will say when they go to the Parmigiano Reggiano farm and they see all this cheese, it just, you just want to go grab one off and eat it like they are. So it's a beautiful film, as we just heard. It's set in Tuscany and um, involves food, but it also involves the human story. So that's Toscana. It opened um, on May 18th on Netflix. You can find it and watch it now. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each episode where I'll recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Be sure to check out the show notes, simplyluxuriouslife.com slash podcast331. And I hope you have a wonderful start to this new month that is June. I'll be back with a brand new episode on Monday, June 20th. Until then, bonjour. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, with the shortened URL, tsll.co. And to welcome Simply Luxurious Living into your everyday life, be sure to check out my new book, The Road to Le Papillon, Daily Meditations on True Contentment, which was just released in March 2022 and became a number one bestseller in France travel and a number one new release in France travel in all four formats, hardback, paperback, audio, and ebook. For more in-depth exploration of how to cultivate your own unique, simply luxurious life, be sure to pick up my first two books. Each are available in hardback, paperback, ebook, and at Audible for audio listening. The first is titled Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life and the second Living the Simply Luxurious Life. Readers can now join the more intimate Simply Luxurious Life international community by becoming members of the blog, which provides ad-free unlimited reading and access to exclusive content such as each month's A Cup of Moments video chat, tours of my home, Le Papillon, the regular monthly post, What Made Me Smile, and Saturday Ponderings, as well as the opportunity to enter all of the giveaways during French and British weeks. To stay caught up on all things Simply Luxurious, the podcast, blog post, and the cooking show, as well as receive exclusive news and an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart your new month, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Life's free monthly newsletter, which arrives on the last day of each month. And there's a weekly newsletter, a favorite of listeners and readers, which is also free and arrives each Friday to keep you caught up on the recent weekly posts on the blog. Enjoy with a hot cup of tea or a cup of morning coffee and stay in the know about all things Simply Luxurious. Thank you for tuning in today. And beginning in September 2022, look for two new episodes on the first and third Wednesdays of each month. So a small change to the day of the week, this podcast will be shared, but always the first and third week of every month, a new episode to listen to. To be alerted to new episodes and when they become available, follow on Instagram, the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, and only the news about this show will be shared. Until next time, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour.